evening, everyone. How y'all doing tonight? Want to welcome you all to week four of our constitutional educational series. Hasn't this been great? Now, I want to remind everyone, if you're watching online or the Victory Channel and you have a prayer need, we have anointed prayer warriors, ministers that are ready to agree with you. Just call 877-281-6297 and they'll lock their faith with you. Amen? All right. Well, you all ready for tonight? Last week was amazing. Jonathan Ritchie took us through seven of the articles, seven of the articles that make up the framework for how our, our government functions. So tonight we close it off. Tonight's the last night. Yeah, I know, right? So I can't wait to see what Tim Barton has in store for us. So welcome from Wall Builders, Tim Barton. Come on out, Tim. There he is. Well, it is good to be back with you guys tonight. Uh, as we dive into the, the conclusion, hopefully we get through the conclusion. Uh, we don't have more parts to the series, but hopefully we make it through. Uh, as we are concluding the series on the Constitution, as we started off on the first night identifying where the, the philosophy of the Founding Fathers was, that they knew that there was a God and God gave rights to man and government's job was to protect those rights. They knew from the idea that there was the laws of nature and nature's God, that God has revealed truth through creation, God's revealed truth through his word, but then there was the consent of the governed that God's idea was this notion from Exodus 18, that you choose leaders from among you to represent the people, leaders of tens, fifties, hundreds, thousands, and this Republican notion, all of these things were what influenced the founding fathers. So we talked about that foundation. It led through from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution, and as they're debating the Constitution, right, finally they do get through the Constitution with the Constitutional Convention. It's on September 17th, when finally the Founding Fathers have something worked out that they're able to come and sign. And that's why every single September 17th, it is officially a holiday known as Constitution Day. Interesting note that there is a federal law that requires public schools the week of September 17th to celebrate and have the students read the actual U.S. Constitution, which basically no public school does. It's actually a law. Nonetheless... Every September 17th, we've talked about how unique this governing document is, that every September 17th, we set a new world record for how stable and prosperous and the longevity of this document. It's, it's just remarkable. With that being said, as the founding fathers were coming together, initially, through the course of several months of the process, there were 55 founding fathers who actually were part of the debate and, and helped with the formation, the drafting, the writing of the Constitution. But when it came time to sign it, there were only 39 of those signers who, or those framers who ended up choosing to sign it. And this is where it does become kind of interesting where their philosophy was. After you've worked so hard to put something together, why, why did some of these people not want to sign it? The two reasons, at least the top two reasons, that you see from individuals who had hesitations about signing it. Number one, they said, there needs to be a bill of rights. There needs to be something that tells the federal government what they can never touch. And Right, you had this debate from the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, and some people said, guys, the Constitution literally tells the government what it can do, and they can only do what the Constitution says it can do, which is part of Article 1, Section 8. However, other founding fathers were smart enough to go, guys, but we know that power is left to themselves, right? They're going to try to usurp and grow and take over, and so there needs to be something that puts even more limitations, and so there were some founding fathers who would not sign it, because it didn't have enough limitations on the federal government. The other thing that people said is there's another dilemma we have, and that other dilemma was the issue of slavery, where there were many founding fathers who said, we're, we're not wanting to join a nation that has the slave trade and slavery. And then there were a couple founding fathers who were like, well, we're not going to be a nation if we can't keep our slaves and have slavery. There was a debate among the founding fathers. But if you go back to Madison's note, it's very interesting that the vast majority of the founding fathers did end up being on the anti-slavery side. And, and let me just read you a few of the things. This is from Madison's notes on the convention, considered the most authoritative source of information from the Constitutional Convention. But here's what Madison recorded from the convention. Governor Morris, the guy who actually wrote the wording of the Constitution, the guy who literally wrote that document, Governor Morris said, 
never would con or he would never would concur with upholding domestic slavery. It was a nefarious institution. It was the curse of heaven on the states where it prevailed. Are they men? Then make them citizens and let them vote. That was part of a debate he had with some of the Southern pro-slavery founding fathers. But then there's people like Colonel Mason. George Mason was from Virginia. George Mason was one of the chief advocates calling for the Bill of Rights. He said this infernal traffic originated in the avarice of British merchants. The British government constantly checked the attempts of Virginia to put a stop to it. Now, it's been a few weeks, but if you remember in the original draft of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson's longest grievance was against the slave trade. And one of the things he said was every legislative attempt the colonies had made, the king had struck down. There was a letter from, from Benjamin Franklin to another pastor where he said that actually in Virginia, they've tried multiple times and the king has struck down every one of their laws. This, this is a reference to that, where George Mason says that every attempt of Virginia to put it to a stop, right, the government constantly checked. Every master of slaves is born a petty tyrant. They bring the judgment of heaven on a country. Now, it's interesting to think that the judgment of heaven on a country, that's, that's pretty strong and profound words. It's about to get a lot stronger. He continued, as nations cannot be rewarded or punished in the next world, they must be in this. By inevitable chain of causes and effects, providence punishes national sins by national calamities. He held it essential on every point of view that the general government should have power to prevent the increase of slavery. Now, let me point out, Abraham Lincoln in the middle of the Civil War said he didn't think the war would conclude until enough blood had been spilled from American soldiers that equaled the amount of blood that had been drawn from the, the back of every black slave in America. Okay? This is one of the founding fathers saying a very similar thought that, guys, we're setting ourselves up for judgment where there could be some national calamities coming. You have people like Oliver Ellsworth as he never owned a slave, which is also worth noting. There are some people that think every founding father was a slave owner. Every founding father was not a slave owner, but we'll keep going. He could not judge the effects of slavery on character because he never had any slaves. He said, however, that if it was to be considered in a moral light, we ought to go no further and free those already in the country. Meaning morally, this is really clear. Right? Like, this is not confusing morally. Morally, slavery is wrong. You have people like Luther Martin. He said it was inconsistent with the principles of the revolution and dishonorable to the American character to have such a feature in the Constitution. So they're debating this. He said, guys, this is contrary to why we fought the revolution. Why do we fight the revolution? It was to gain liberty and freedom. Right? Going back to the idea that, that all men were created equal, that all of us have been endowed with certain liberal rights, life, Liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Literally, he's arguing the declaration is why we shouldn't have slavery. Then you have people like Hugh Williamson who said, both in opinion and practice, he was against slavery. Now, this is all from Madison's notes. These are not the only guys who came out against this, but this is part of the sentiment. Now, the reason this matters is because there were some people who would not sign the Constitution because it didn't resolve the issue of slavery or it didn't have a Bill of Rights. So when the Constitution is done, September 17th, it's sent to the states to be ratified. And under the Articles of Confederation, one of the many problems with the Articles of Confederation was it required that anything that was going to be done had to be done unanimously. Well, the Founding Fathers had tried to pass many things to, to make government stronger, to, to, to beef up the Articles of Confederation, but there was always one or two states who would hold out, and so they couldn't get it passed. And so one of the changes, it's actually part of Article 7, but it's in the Constitution, and one of the changes was that it was only going to require nine of the 13 states in order to ratify. And part of the reason they chose nine, the debate went that we want the, the majority of Americans to be on side of this. And, and so they said, well, what, what if it's just the majority of states, right? There's 13 colonies. What if we just get seven states? And the argument meant, went, but what if those seven states are the least populated? Then you'd have the majority of states, but not the majority of people. And they said, well, we want both. So let's do, let's do nine states. Because then if you have nine states, you will not only have the majority of states, you'll have the majority of people. This is also part of uh, when you look at some of their discussion and debates, even where they landed on the Electoral College. The idea was that you needed the majority of the people and the majority of the locations, the counties, the states, whatever the case was. As this goes to the states, starting on December 7th, there were five states that began to ratify, and they ratified pretty quickly back to back. Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, and Connecticut. And, and the, like, this was December 7th is when Delaware ratified. Uh, on January 9th is when Connecticut ratified. So in, in roughly a month, five states have ratified. We're making progress. 
And then it gets to Massachusetts. And Massachusetts is one of the places where founding fathers said, wait a second. Like, we think there's some good things in here, but we're afraid that it doesn't limit the federal government enough. So Massachusetts would split, and they determined that we'll go ahead and we'll vote in favor of this with the condition that in the first Congress, they add some amendments that are going to secure some of our rights that are going to place greater limits on government. And so Massachusetts agreed. And then there were several other states that followed that agreed with Massachusetts. And they said, okay, we'll join in like Maryland, South Carolina, New Hampshire. We're going to join in, but we agree there needs to be some limitations. There needs to be some amendments to the Constitution. And so at the point you have nine states, New Hampshire was a nine state. So when New Hampshire joins in, this was June 21st, 1788. Now we have an actual constitution. It's been ratified. So now it applies to all 13 states. Also worth noting, after it's ratified, well, then you did have Virginia that joined on board and New York that joined on board. And finally, North Carolina and Rhode Island did agree. Kind of a side note, they did not ratify the Constitution in North Carolina and Georgia until after we already were operating as a nation. We already had the first Congress. Washington was already sworn in. It was only after the first amendments were sent back to the states and they saw the amendments. They're like, oh, okay, now we'll join, right? You have some amendments in place. There's checks and balances. There's just some more protections. So they actually joined after Washington was already president, after the Bill of Rights or the, the amendments were sent back. But as you look at this, it's worth noting that if you even go to the ratification debates, one of the things that is super interesting about this, and, and this is actually, you can go back to Eliot's debates and talk about this, but even, I'll, I'll point to a few more places. Let me, let me show this first. So of the 13 colonies that, that voted to ratify the Constitution, that's really all the colonies at that point, but of the original 13 colonies as they're voting to ratify the Constitution, what's super interesting about this is that in five of those states, one of the things that happened after we separated from Great Britain, those states wrote new constitutions, was that in those states, they identified that everyone in the state has equal rights. And they even specified that former slaves and former African slaves have the same right and opportunity to vote as the white people. So when it went to the ratification conventions and there were votes in five states, Black and white people were voting to ratify this. Now, this is very important because some people say, well, this was only white people and this was for white people and the Constitution is racist. It's a lot different than most people think because even if you go, so, so the Dred Scott decision, one of the most racist Supreme Court decisions ever, but in the dissent, Justice Benjamin Curtis identified one of the many reasons the Dred Scott decision was wrong, but one of the things he said, and, and, and just in case you don't know, the Dred Scott decision is where the majority of the Supreme Court said, that no black person has a right that any white person needs to recognize here in America. Okay, super racist, super awful, terrible decision, but Justice Benjamin Curtis came out against that. And in his dissent, one of the many things he pointed to of why this was ridiculous and wrong, one of the things he said was, it has been often asserted that the Constitution was made exclusively by and for the white race. It has already been shown that in five of the 13 original states, Colored persons then possessed the elective franchise and were among those by whom the Constitution was ordained and established. So, so he's explaining, right, to other justices and to the American people, when you're saying that, right, black people don't have the same rights as white people or we don't need to recognize those rights, he says, guys, remember, in five of those states, they were the ones helping vote to ratify the Constitution, right? The thing that you seem to care about or pretend like you care about, he continued. If so, it is not true in point of fact that the Constitution was made exclusively by the white race. One of the pro-slavery racist arguments was that the Constitution or the rights, even the Bill of Rights, only applied to white people. And he said, that's not true at all. Now, the reason, again, I wanna point this out is because there's a lot of misinformation about American history and, and a lot of accusations. And oftentimes America gets accused of sins that she's not wholly guilty of, right? We live in an era and culture where people are literally trying to rewrite much of the history to make America seem more sinful than she was. And let me just throw a newsflash out there. You don't have to lie to make America seem more sinful than she was. Just study history and you'll realize that she was plenty sinful by herself, right? Like she doesn't need your help. Study history, but what you will also see is in the midst of her not being a perfect nation, you will realize that she's not guilty of most of the sins she's accused of. 
And what's even more important, and we'll talk about this a little later on this evening, is that as you go through the history of America, what is consistently true is every time that sin and evil reared its ugly head, what brought a stop to that sin and evil were the Christians who recognized what was happening was not biblical and they needed to fight against that evil. That's why it stopped in America. But as we move forward, when the Constitution is ratified, New Hampshire is a ninth state, they ratify it. So now Congress has a designated date to meet. So Congress comes together early on there in New York. It's before they go to Washington, D.C. But Congress meets on March 4th, 1789. And one of the first things they do is they start figuring out, okay, we're going to have a president coming along pretty soon. What does this need to look like, right? The inauguration, the ceremony. And I think Jonathan last week probably talked about a little bit uh, Washington's inauguration and some of the activities and, and what they determined with going to church and, and communion and some of the things that took place. But then they also determined we need to start working on these amendments, these rights that we're supposed to work on. And as they're in the middle of that process, you then have George Washington showing up. You have the first presidential inauguration on April 30th, 1789. He becomes the president. And as he's president, he is now the leader of the nation, but Congress has been busy at work this whole time trying to come up with a Bill of Rights or with amendments to the Constitution. It's not yet known as a Bill of Rights, but they're coming up with amendments. And so because there were many states that said that we will support this, but we need amendments, they sent delegates specifically to try to get amendments to the Constitution. For example, when James Madison came, James Madison came with 20 proposed amendments to the Constitution. He's not the only one, but he certainly was a noted guy coming. He's a leader. And as he got there, they begin debating all these different amendments. But let's start with, for example, James Madison. James Madison had 20 amendments that were proposed. Well, in the House, they begin debating through amendments and the House ends up selecting 17 amendments they think are reasonable. And if you remember in the Constitution, the amendment process from Article 5 is Congress can propose amendments, but then they have to be sent to the states. The states ratify them. So it was going to be up to we, the people, what the Constitution was actually going to be. So, so the House, they're debating this, but after it goes to the House, they got to send it to the Senate because the Senate has to debate it. They have to agree on things. In the Senate, they narrow the list down to only 12 amendments. So there's 12 amendments. It goes back to the House. It passes the House. And at this point... The House and the Senate agreed on these 12 potential amendments. Now it's time to send it to the people to see what the people want. Well, when it went to the people, it did end up passing with 10 amendments, became known as the Bill of Rights. But the First and Second Amendment were the ones that did not pass right away. The First Amendment dealt with representation and, and, and how congressmen would be selected. But the Second Amendment actually dealt with congressional pay. And I'm saying Second Amendment, this was the proposed Second Amendment that came from Congress. The proposed Second Amendment actually became the 27th Amendment in 1992. <laughs> it finally did pass because finally enough states ratified it that it passed. It just took a couple hundred years to get there, okay? But the third through the 12th proposed amendments that one of the states, it, that did pass and it became the Bill of Rights. In fact, on September 25th, 1789 is when these 12 amendments are sent to the states and by December 15th, 1791, now we're talking of more than a year, right? Really two years, more than two years in this process before finally enough states have ratified, but they finally ratify. And then you have what we know as the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments. And so when it's finally, you have enough votes, enough states ratified it, then it becomes official. It's now part of the constitution. And, and this is where, if we look at the Bill of Rights, again, what we know is the Bill of Rights, it's our first 10 amendments of the constitution. If you look at amendment number one, amendment number one, there are five freedoms in the first amendment. Currently in America today, only one in 1,000 Americans are able to identify all five freedoms in the first amendment. And as you go through, it says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. So you have religious freedom or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, right? Uh, or the freedom of speech, second amendment, or excuse me, second freedom, or the freedom of the press, or the right of the people to peaceably assemble. I think peaceably is interesting, right? It's, just, it's probably not relevant for us today, but that's interesting, right? Peaceably assemble, okay, peaceably, or to petition the government for redress of grievances. The five freedoms are religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. Only one in a thousand Americans can name those. Why this matters is most Americans don't even know what their guaranteed secured freedoms were in the First Amendment or in the Bill of Rights. And also it's worth noting, when the Founding Fathers drafted these amendments, when the states ratified them, 
These amendments were not telling the people what their freedoms were. They were telling the government what they could never touch. Right? I want to point this out because if you read the First Amendment, there's actually a restrictive prohibitive clause of the First Amendment. It starts off saying Congress and it goes on to say shall make no law. Who is limited? The government. Federal government is limited. You know who's not limited? High school students, teachers, pastors, right? We're not limited. The federal government is limited. If you paid attention over the last week or two, there have been some pretty awesome Supreme Court decisions coming down, right? One that came out last Friday dealt with Coach Joe Kennedy, who was the football coach, right? Who on his own, at the end of a... Now, this is a 20-year military veteran, right? He's, he's a 20-year Marine, and he then goes to a school. He's a high school football coach, and he fought for freedom for everybody, so he wants to practice a little freedom at the end of the football game. He goes to the 50-yard line by himself, kneels down in prayer, and, and this is his routine. He goes and thanks God for freedom, thanks God for keeping these boys safe on the football field, and over time, some boys see him, and they come up and say, hey, coach... Can, can we join you? And he says, as a 20-year Marine veteran would say, it's a free country. You do what you want to do. <laughs> and so these boys joined him. What's crazy about this is what led to this stopping was there was a parent who wrote the administration not to complain. The parent wrote and said, I think it's so incredible that you have a, a coach who is setting such a good example for these boys and these boys are joining in prayer and the administration went, whoa, there's prayer happening? <laughs> we didn't even know. So they go and tell him he can't pray anymore. He says, I I'm not gonna stop praying, right? I, I have the freedom to do this. He says, no, you don't. He gets fired for that. Here's the point. The Supreme Court ruled that the school was wrong in doing that. This should never have been a challenge or issue. Why? Because people say, well, separation of church and state. It's not in the First Amendment. It's not in the Constitution. Do you know what is in the Constitution? That Congress shall make no law. That is the only limitation. It's not on we the people. Why? Because we weren't scared of we the people being tyrants. We just fought a war against a tyrannical government. Right? That's what we were trying to limit was the government. This is very, very important. When you read the Bill of Rights, it was a list of limitations to say, federal government, there are certain things you can never touch. And we were making sure we secured things for ourselves. This is what they call a, a negative listing or a listing of negative liberties. Okay? This is not saying, as individuals, you have this right, this right, this right, and this right, but no more. Nope. This was saying, government, just to make sure. There's a bunch of things you can never touch. And on that list include, it's telling the government what they can't do, not telling us what we can do. Okay? This is the limitation. Now, that's part of the First Amendment. Again, there are five freedoms in the First Amendment. Most Americans cannot name any, much less all five. I would encourage you. If you don't know what your freedoms are, you won't know when they're being taken away. This is the reason we have battled for literally decades on issues. Most Americans don't even know the three branches of government. And this is not hyperbole. Literally two out of three Americans that have been polled and surveyed over the last decades could not identify the three branches of government. Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, when, when she was first elected, she said, yeah, you have the president and you have the House and the Senate. The, those are not the three branches, right? You have the legislative, executive, and judicial. The, those are the three branches, right? So, so you have Congress and the House and Senate. You, you have the president over the executive branch and you have judicial, right? Which Supreme Court is the highest of judicial, but then you have lower courts as well. All that to be said, if, if we don't know what this is, I, I think it's so profound when Jesus said in John that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You cannot be set free from truth you do not know. And this applies on all kinds of things in our life, but certainly it's true when we are looking at the Bill of Rights was written to limit the federal government. And so th this is amendment number one. Amendment number two, something we should be familiar with, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The Supreme Court 
last week, actually a week and a half ago now, came out with the New York gun decision, right? Where in New York, they said that you don't have the right to carry a firearm with your person in our state. And the Supreme Court said, no, it says right to keep bear arms. Like that, that, that's actually in the constitution. You can do that. Again, keep in mind, why were they putting this in the constitution? Well, what had they just experienced? We talked about on, on the very first of these four sessions, if you wanna know why they were passing the laws, why they wrote things the way they did, the US Supreme Court even said, the best way to interpret why a law was written is to determine the evil which was to be remedied. What, what problem were they trying to solve? Why did they say we need a well-regulated militia? Because you never know when a government leader might feel a little too big for their britches, yeah. right? You, you never know when tyranny and oppression might come knocking at your door. If you go to the shot heard around the world at Lexington Green, the British were on their way to take all of the guns away. That's what they were doing. They were going to take the military, military storehouse and supplies away. That was the guns, the gunpowder, right? The balls used to shoot the cannons and the muskets. They were going to take all the military supplies away. If you are going to conquer people, the easiest thing to do to them first is disarm them, right? Because then it's easy to defeat them. What I will point out is when the, the several states that ratified the constitution said there's some amendments we want, it's worth noting, if you really want to understand what the Second Amendment was trying to do, you can go and read the proposed amendments that came from several states, and you can see the language they suggested should be an amendment to the Constitution to give you context for what they were thinking and why they were thinking it. For example, looking at the Bill of Rights, right, knowing that, that these states wanted to have some limitations of the federal government, if you look, for example, up in New Hampshire, New Hampshire proposed, Congress shall never disarm any citizen. Now, Congress was the government. That, that's who it's representing, right? The government should never be able to disarm the people. That was their proposal. Or you can look somewhere like Massachusetts that said that the said constitution be never construed to prevent the people of the United States who are peaceable citizens from keeping their own arms. Amen. It's worth noting they did say peaceable. I actually support that. I don't think we probably should be giving violent felons firearms, right? Like, I feel like that's a problem. You know, somebody went to prison for murder and rape and we're like, yeah, get guns. It's not like, no, probably they shouldn't have. But notice, they said as long as you're peaceable, that, that's all that matters. Let's keep going. Because you also have places like in Pennsylvania. It says no law should be passed for disarming the people or any of them. I don't know why we needed that clarity. <laughs> right? Like, just in case we're confused on people, which actually, actually, this is more relevant today than it was in their time for sure. Right? <laughs> Just in case you're not sure who you are, it's for any of them, right? It goes even further because at, at, at this time, there is a founding father, James Wilson, who signed the declaration, then he signed the constitution, then he was appointed to the Supreme Court by George Washington. George Washington appointed six justices. He's one of the six that was appointed. And while he is there, he actually starts what's considered to be one of the first organized law trainings. In early America, if you wanted to be a lawyer, you would study for law, you would take the bar exam, and then you would, you would apprentice, you would mentor under an attorney. And he said, instead of doing this like one-on-one, -on -one, why don't we just have a group of people come together and we'll talk to the whole group of people who are studying for the law. And so his law lectures end up being published in a three volume law book set, but, but his law lectures are a foundational understanding for early Americans of the way the law should be, because he was a founding father who was a part of everything. Looking at the second amendment, here's part of what he told his law students at the time. He said, the great natural law of self-preservation cannot be repealed or superseded or suspended by any human institution. Now, this is going back to a law of nature, right? That God put in us the, the law of self-preservation, yeah. right? That, that we will defend ourselves, we'll defend our family, our spouse, our kids. There's something God put in us. And what's significant, he says, is that no human institution can ever come against this thing that God put in us. But he goes further. He says, the right of the citizens to bear arms in the defense of themselves shall not be questioned. That is actually his explanation of the Constitution in the Second Amendment, right? So the right of the people to keep and bear arms, he's like, yeah, if you want a gun to defend yourself, nobody can ask questions. 
And then he gives even more explanation. He says, every man's house is deemed by the law to be his castle. And the law invests him with the power and places on him the duty of the commanding officer of his house. Which I just want to pause at the commanding officer of my house. Like, I feel a new title should be coming for us, right? Like, commander, master, chief, something, I don't know. But commander of my house, I like this. Here's where it gets interesting, though. He says that all of us, right? So if, if you own a home, now, if you are a single lady, then you can be the queen of your castle. That's fine, right? But, but you are in charge of your castle. Here's where it gets interesting. He said, every man's house is his castle. And if any man be robbed in it, it shall be esteemed his own default and negligence. <laughs> okay. This is not talking about while you are gone, somebody breaks in. This is talking about if you are home and somebody starts kicking in the door and you call 911, and, please get here quick. I mean, like, I'm probably calling 911. I'm like, hey, you might need to come pick up a body here in a second. Right? Like, it's probably a different conversation. It's worth noting, he says the, right, the responsibility of self-preservation is not somebody else's for your own life. The responsibility of the self-preservation of your family is not somebody else's. It goes back to the law of nature. Right? Police, in addition to this, they are a responsive force. Right? And, and, and if they're responding to a call... And the average police response time is eight, 10 minutes nationally. Do, do you really have eight, 10 minutes? But this is his point, right? It's like, no, no, you are the king of your castle. And also this is an era where they understood castles a little different than we do, right? In, in a little different era, if you had a castle, the defense of the castle is on the king of the castle, right? Or the knights, the people involved. This is what he's saying is that self-preservation is something we have, but because we have that, this is why the right of the people to keep and bear arms should never be questioned. Because it's about self-preservation in these situations. And he's not the only founding father to hold that position. I can go through a lot of founding fathers, but Sam Adams is another easy example. Sam Adams said, the Constitution should never be construed to prevent the people of the United States who are peaceable citizens from keeping their own arms. The, the founding fathers actually did believe there, there could and maybe should be some limitations but as long as you are not a violent criminal offender, you should be able to have a firearm for self-preservation, for defense of yourself and your family. George Washington said it very succinctly. He said, a free people ought to be armed. Amen. You, do you know the best way to preserve freedom? Is to have guns, right? There was a reason that during World War II, after Japan had hit Pearl Harbor, that Japan said, we're not invading the United States of America. If you go back and look it up, the emperor said, we will never do a land invasion because behind every blade of grass would be a rifle. <laughs> the idea was back then, Americans were armed and they were willing to use their firearms to protect themselves, their friends, their family, their neighbors. This is part of the idea of the Second Amendment. Now, the Second Amendment is not about being violent or bloody or wanting to shed blood. Like, this is totally not what we're talking about. There's a difference between self-defense, right, where you are trying to preserve life and the idea of taking a life. Where people are like, oh, I just, I, I, I could never do violence. I don't ever want to do violence. But if it comes down to something happening to my wife or somebody else, I know what I'm choosing. Right? Like, th that's not complicated for me. And if you go even further, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5, 8, that he who will not provide for his own family is worse than an infidel, worse than a non-believer. Well, what, what maybe should a husband provide for the family? I would argue the husband should be providing some level of security and, and, and protection, so maybe provision on some level. If, if you were a husband, Right? And, and this is actually a, a real scenario. When I was in, I went to a Bible college. When I was in college, I had a professor who was an extreme pacifist. And this professor said, well, I mean, really, God doesn't want us to hurt anybody. And I mean, I kind of agree with that. that. That was not God's intent, but neither was sin. And sin happened, and so the world's different, right? But he said, God doesn't want us to hurt anybody. And so we should, he said, we should never commit acts of violence against anybody else. Again, theoretically, I support that. But I had a question. I said, sir, I'm just curious. What if you're on a date with your wife? You're, you're over in Dallas and a group of violent thugs come up. They knock you to the ground and they begin assaulting, maybe even sexually assaulting your wife. Are you saying you would not get up at that point and physically try to defend your wife? He said, I would just pray really hard in that moment. <laughs> now, 
In fairness, I would pray really hard in that moment too. My prayer would just be different, right? <laughs> My prayer is, God, give me the strength of Samson right now. I'm about to tear some jaw bones in half, right? Like it's gonna be different. With this being said, right, this is where I, I understand, right? I, I'm not trying to get into a theological conversation and, and, and go that route necessarily. I'm giving context. Why do the founding fathers believe in the Second Amendment? It was about making sure we had protections against a government that might get tyrannical and might overreach, okay? Every single communist dictator, before they inflicted evil on their people, disarmed the people. That is the history of the world. It is easier to enslave people once they are disarmed, right? It's easier to murder them once they're disarmed. This is why in America we said, yeah, we're going to make sure we keep guns, right? We're going to be different. That is the Second Amendment. That's what it's about. The right to keep and bear arms, right? Shall not be infringed. That's the idea. And, and we don't need to get into militia necessarily, but the idea of a militia, a militia back then literally was every physical, able-bodied person in the town who had a gun. That's literally what a militia was. So this is not talking about police force. It's not talking about the military. It's talking about physically able, capable people who had a firearm. You could be called on a militia to defend the town, to defend right, a family, a store, whatever the case was. That's part of the Second Amendment. If you go to the Third Amendment, as we're walking this sequence, it says, no soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Why did they think this needed to be included? This goes back to one of the grievances, actually grievance number 14 in the Declaration of Independence. One of the grievances we had against the king was he was quartering troops against our will. He sent troops over and he said, yeah, and they're going to live with you and you're going to feed them. You're going to take care of them. You're going to bathe them. You're going to wash their clothes. And they're like, this is ridiculous, right? What are, why are we doing this? And some of the states recognized that problem did not get solved in the first draft of the Constitution. So there needs to be an amendment to resolve the problem again. Keep in mind, as we're reading these things, what problem were they trying to solve or what were they trying to prevent? Well, look at the evil they were trying to remedy. So this actually goes back to the grievance number 14, the Declaration of Independence, and then you get to grievance number four. Grievance number four, it says, or amendment number four, not grievance, amendment four, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effect against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall be issued, but upon probable cause. Supported by oath or affirmation and particularly described, uh, describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. This is very important understanding some historical context. Why are we saying, first of all, no unreasonable searches and seizures. And secondly, you need probable cause and you really need a warrant. If you go back to the founding fathers, one of the, the, the fathers of the Sons of Liberty, James Otis. James Otis was the, the birthing member of the Sons of Liberty. Uh, it was his notion for committees of correspondence. Like he was this incredible leader. He was the mentor of nearly every founding father. But in 1761, James Otis got up in front of British government officials and he gave a fiery speech against a writ of assistance. Now, what's a writ of assistance? A writ of assistance is back then. So if, if anybody has ever seen a warrant today, now hopefully you haven't seen them in person, but maybe like NCIS, I don't know, CSI, I don't know what you watch, right? Maybe you've seen a warrant before. This warrant is blank. A writ of assistance was a blank warrant that a British officer and official would have. They would show up at somebody's house and they would say, I'm coming in to look and see what you have. And if they found something they didn't like, they would then fill out the warrant and say, I am authorized to take this from you. That was a writ of assistance, which not to digress, I will point out, I think it's kind of interesting that the IRS can show up and say, hey, I wanna see all of your financials for the last several years with no probable cause, right? Without a warrant, like, I, seems like we dealt with this issue before, right? But James Otis, dealing with his writ of assistance, here's part of what he said was the problem with it. I will to my dying day oppose with all the power and faculties God has given me all such instruments of slavery and villainy as a writ of assistance is. It is the worst instrument of arbitrary power and is destructive of liberty and the fundamental principle of law. One of the most essential rights is the freedom of one's house. 
A man's house is his castle. But these writs totally annihilate this right. Now, again, keep in mind, if any government, if a police officer could show up to your house, open the door and walk in without your approval, right? Without you even being home at times. And they can go throughout the house looking for anything they think might be illegal. And then they fill out the warrant afterwards. Like that is a crazy violation. This is what a writ of assistance was. He continued. It is a power that places the liberty of every man in the hands of every petty officer who may reign secure in his petty tyranny or tyranny and spread terror and desolation around him. Both reason and the constitution are against such writs. The reason we had the fourth amendment was to make sure that officers can't just arbitrarily be like, you know what? I don't like that person. I'm going to go investigate that person. Now, there's probably reason to revisit some of this today because we're not just necessarily talking about profiling on some level, right? I'm not necessarily against profiling on some level. However, sometimes the level of profiling we are doing or sometimes what's happening, like certainly we could have some honest, good conversations about should there be some reforms and some procedures from some police officers or sheriffs? Absolutely. Understand the context too. This is not a brand new issue. When Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes that there is nothing new under the sun, I, I will just tell you, for every student of history, it is very similar to Ecclesiastes 3, where he says, everything that was will be again. Yeah. Be because the, the flesh, the human nature, the passions of men, they don't necessarily change over time. We deal with the same fleshly, sinful human nature, the same arbitrarily overreach of governments over time. That's why we had a Bill of Rights. Keep going. Amendment number five. It said, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, meaning that somebody had to approve, yep, it looks really bad, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when an actual service in the time of war or public danger. Continued, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be put or to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. This is the, the double jeopardy idea, right? That you can't be tried twice for the same crime. Keep going. It says, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. So, right, if you plead the fifth, as a fifth amendment, you don't have to testify against yourself. I plead the fifth, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Now, let me back up to this notion. You don't have to testify against yourself. This is something that was not unusual in tyrannical governments with kings is they would throw people in prison and they would abuse you until you testified against yourself to being guilty of whatever crime they accused you of. And then they were like, ah, we got a confession. Well, you did get a confession, right? Was it a good confession? No, but they said, right, this is why, no, if, if you're gonna say somebody's guilty of a crime, you're gonna have to have somebody outside of that person to identify them as being guilty of a crime. That's also a biblical standard. Right? When actually it's supposed to be in the testimony of two or three witnesses, right? It, we'll come to that in a second. But amendment number six, it says that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial. Let's stop there. There were people that were in Washington, D.C. on January 6th that have still not even been accused of a crime. They have had, the, the fourth through the eighth amendment is what's known as the due process clause in the Bill of Rights. They have literally had their due, proce due process rights stripped from them. They haven't even been charged, much less gotten a speedy and public trial and noticed by an impartial jury, that also seems significant, of the state and district. Now, it's also of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed. This is going back to the founding era. The reason they put this in there is because there were times that a British official would arrest Americans and they would send them to England to have a trial. And they get to England, they'd be like, you guys don't understand what it's like or what happened or who was there. And they said, yeah, if there's really gonna be justice, it needs to be people who understand the context of that era and what's going on, right? So, so this is part of that notion. And as it goes on, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation. This is also interesting for January 6th because these people are being held without even being informed of the accusations against them. And 
It says, uh, Amendment 6, that you're also supposed to be able to confront the witnesses against you. If there are no charges against you, there's no witnesses bringing those charges against you. And to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses, so you can call witnesses in your defense. Again, if you haven't had a charge, you can't call witnesses, you can't defend yourself, you can't confront your accusers, a lot of problems in his favor and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. So if, right, this is where if you don't have an attorney, if you can't afford an attorney, right, the state, the government will provide you one. This goes back to these Miranda rights that officers are supposed to read people before they arrest them. This is part of the due process that they're supposed to inform people of according to the Bill of Rights. Let's keep going. Amendment number seven. It says, in suits at common law where the value in controversy shall exceed $20. Let me just clarify at this point, that is every single issue that exceeds $20, right? They haven't changed that language. So yes, any, any litigation that happens, any suits, uh, any common law issues, everything's over the $20. But the right of trial by jury shall be preserved and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise reexamined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. What this is, is if a jury has heard you, and this is why it's a jury of your peers, right? If people who are normal people heard your case and they're like, I totally relate. I'm like, nope, I'm, I'm not gonna hold you guilty for that. I, I, that's totally justified. For example, there was a father who heard noise in his little daughter's room, walked in and saw a man molesting his little daughter and the father beat the man to death. Seems a little tough, but that wasn't a good scenario. The family of the molester sued the man who beat the molester to death. And the jury was like, nah, I can relate. I'd have done the same thing, right? If that was my daughter, I, nah, I'm, I'm with you. If there is a jury trial and by your peers, the idea was this helps protect you from a tyrannical judicial individual might be a judge who just wants to, to do bad against you or harm against you. And right now we do know there are some prosecutors, some, some district attorneys in certain places in America, right? Who have a different bent on, on what evil is, a different definition of evil, right? A different idea of justice. But this is why this trial by jury and a jury of your peers became so important. And then you have uh, amendment number eight. It says excessive bail shall not be required nor excessive fines imposed nor cruel and unusual punishment. So you can't give somebody ridiculous penalties if it doesn't fit the crime, right? If somebody stole a Snickers bar, you can't hold them on bail for $3 million. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit the crime. This is, is what we know, amendments four through eight are what we know as the due process clauses of the Bill of Rights. Here's what's interesting about this. Where did, where did the due process notion, where did these amendments originate, these ideas for these amendments? And here's where it's fascinating. Right now, a Supreme Court Justice, Stephen Breyer, who's announced his retirement, right? There's already an individual who's been confirmed to take his place. Stephen Breyer's an incredibly liberal justice, but Stephen Breyer identified that the due process clauses we have in the Bill of Rights, actually, he says, if you go to Federal Practice and Procedure Volume 30, he says, it clearly identifies that those due process clauses actually came largely because of the influence of the pilgrims and the Puritans, okay? So, so what's the connection with the pilgrims and the Puritans? Because we're told today, wait a second, these intolerant Christians, here's what's fascinating, right? Why today do people consider the Puritans to be intolerant? Well, there might be a couple reasons, but the number one reason is because of the witch trials. Well, if you look at the witch trials, right? What happened during the witch trials is 27 people died during the witch trials. 19 people were executed. Eight people had died in prison awaiting their sentences. And the witch trials arguably lasted for 18 months. Now, really, it was much fewer months that the real trials were taking place as far as the, the, the number of them. But let's say 18 months is how long they lasted. The significant question I would ask is why did the trials end? The reason it ended is there were Christian leaders at the time who saw what was happening in some of the trials and they actually went to the governor at the time, Governor Phipps. They said, Governor Phipps, this is crazy what is happening in these trials because in these trials, they're taking hearsay evidence where they're not even having a person show up to, to testify against this person. And then the person's not able to call witnesses in their defense. And they went through like, this is totally unbiblical. So when the governor hears this, he goes to Judge Sewell. Judge Sewell is one of the judges overseeing the trials. And when Governor Phipps asked Judge Sewell, Judge Sewell's like, oh yeah, we are doing that. that. Yeah, that's not good. We should stop that. They put a stop to the trials. Now, let me go back. 
These Christian leaders who said this is really, really bad, it needs to stop. Why did they think that maybe this person should be able to confront their accuser and not just take hearsay evidence? This is where, even in federal practice and procedures, it points to the influence of the Bible on the Puritans and pilgrims that led to the due process clause. Because if you go, for example, to John 8, verse 10, this is the woman that was caught in adultery, right? And after Jesus knelt and written in the sand and he gets up and he says, woman, where are thine accusers? They've all gone. Well, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. They point it out. You're supposed to be able to confront your accusers. And if there are no accusers, you can't be guilty of a crime. Well, that's super interesting. That's actually a thought from the Bible that these Christian leaders used even in the witch trials to put a stop to them. Also, in Proverbs 18, 17, it says one side sounds right until the other side is heard. Yeah. This is why you're supposed to be able not just to confront your accusers, but you're supposed to be able to call witnesses in your defense who can say, that's not true at all. This is what happened. This is what was the foundation for what became known as the due process. And there's a lot more we can go through. We just don't have time to do that tonight. But this is where, why Stephen Breyer, like the most secular justice maybe ever of the U.S. Supreme Court, even Stephen Breyer said the reason that we have these due process clauses from the Bible, and he even said it's in Federal Practice and Procedure, Volume 30. Federal Practice and Procedure is the, the culmination of all the laws of America. It's where if you're going to be an attorney, you want to know precedent. Like This is where you study case law and precedent, and Federal Practice and Procedure, Volume 30, is where they give the history of due process and where these amendments really originated, where these ideas came from. And they point out in this official law book that the due process came from these Puritans. And, and let me revisit this for a second, because today we're told, we're, well, these, these, these Christians were so intolerant. There were 27 people that died during these witch trials. If you look at Europe, there were witch trials that happened in Europe. And in Europe, the witch trials lasted for a decade. There was a historian who documented that over in the European witch trials, more than 500,000 people were put to death in the European witch trials. Only 27 people were put to death in America. Now, that's still a problem. We should not have done that. But in context, here's an interesting question. Why did the witch trial stop in America? Because of what we have come to know as the due process rights that were from the Bible where they said, that's not the way you conduct a trial. We need to do it different. The Bible literally shaped the policy that made this nation different than everywhere else in the world and saved more lives during the witch trials than anywhere else in the world. This is, again, part of the influence of the Bible, but that's why we even have due process in the amendments in the Bill of Rights. If you go to amendment number nine, it says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Now, this is where they wanted to give a catch-all because they said, right, we have given rights to people. In the First Amendment, there's five, right, where you have religion and speech and press and petition and assembly. And in the Second Amendment, the right of self-defense and you have the privacy of the home and the home is your castle. And, and so they go through rights. They said, just, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. There are more rights that people have that we did not identify. So government, don't think we only have the rights we identified in the Bill of Rights. There are other limitations you have. This is absolutely true. But this is super interesting because the Ninth Amendment clarifies we have even more rights and the government can't infringe on our rights. Now, the rights they refer to are our God-given rights. The Founding Fathers went much further than what we've identified. If you look at what happened with the Dobbs decision, which overturned Roe versus Wade, right? And this argument from President Biden was that, well, they've just taken away a constitutional right to abortion. Remind me where in the Constitution was the right to abortion? Because I've read it a few times and I've never seen abortion mentioned in the Constitution. What I have seen mentioned is that we have a lot of rights that are protected. The federal government can never come against, but a right to abortion is not one. You know what is? The right to life. That's actually protected in the Ninth Amendment because that is a God-given right. The Founding Fathers identified in the Declaration, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Those are other rights that were not listed in the Bill of Rights, but still belong to the people, retain the people. And then you have the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment says, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved for the states respectively or to the people. This is huge. What is said was that if the Constitution didn't explicitly say the federal government had this power, then they don't, and it belongs to the states. 
This is actually why when the Supreme Court ruled in this Dobbs decision that overturned Roe versus Wade, they said, this is not a power the federal government has. Well, that is correct. The federal government does not have the authorization to justify or give a right to abortion. Now, it's also worth noting, states don't have that right either, right? States do not have the right to determine if murder or rape is going to be legal in that state, right? Well, it's states' rights. So in California, we're, no, no, it doesn't matter where you are. Those are inalienable rights and government exists to protect your God-given inalienable rights, okay? So even though people are now saying it's a states' rights issue, this is no more a states' rights issue than slavery was, okay? Th th this is not a states' right. This is, this is a morally inferior argument from people who are trying to justify sinful, wicked, evil behavior. This is not in the Constitution and it's not protected in the Bill of Rights, okay? With that being said, it is also really worth noting in the Constitution, there is not a single mention of the education of children. You know who should have no say in the education of our children? The government. It, it's interesting. If you just start looking at things the government does today and go back to the Constitution, it's very clear they don't have that right. And, and let me also clarify, after these 10 amendments were ratified by the states, what happens is if you go to Washington, D.C., if you go to the National Archives, you can see the actual Bill of Rights. On the bottom of the Bill of Rights, there are two signatures. You will see at the very bottom, John Adams, who was the vice president. Now, as vice president, why would he sign that? Because vice president is actually the president of the Senate. So you had the leader of the Senate and the leader of the House sign that document. So John Adams, vice president, but leader of the Senate. And then you had Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg. Now, Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg was the reverend Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg. I don't have time to get into this story tonight. He's remarkable. What's worth noting is he was the first speaker of the house. The first speaker of the house in our Congress was a pastor. And when you look at the people who helped authorize and framed our bill of rights, it's also worth noting there were a lot of pastors in that assembly because as our nation was formed, if you go through the history of our nation, right? All the founding fathers accomplished, what is absolutely historically evident as you study history is our nation became a nation because of the influence of the church, of Christians and pastors. Yes. Even when it came to our founding and governing documents, the church, Christianity and pastors played a role in what happened. And this is why it's not even surprising if you go back to some of the founding fathers writings, some of the most famous statements made even about the constitution were John Adams. He said that our constitution was made only for a moral and a religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Why did he think that our constitution only works if you have religion and morality? Because in America, we believed in giving freedom to people, but we knew freedom only works if we have a moral foundation and the only way you have a moral foundation is through religion and, and, and don't misunderstand. They're not saying religion as we might say that today. They're saying religion and they actually clarified in their writings. It was the religion of Christianity. It was a belief in Christianity in the Bible. The Bible laid the foundation for morality, which allowed our nation to be free. And this is why in the most significant political address ever delivered in our nation's history, it's considered to have been George Washington's farewell address. In George Washington's farewell address, given in 1796, he's leaving office. He wants the American people to, to keep several things in mind about how we will be successful going forward. And he talks about avoiding foreign entanglements and don't get caught up with every other nation. Let's, let's, let's focus on solving our own problems. It's a little bit of like the plank guy verse, right? Like, don't worry about their issues. Let's solve our issues first. He talks about the, the danger of loving political party more than principle, that if you just support a party against the, the more significant virtue of the principle, then you will compromise your principles to support a party when what makes our nation great are principles and the principles, so like several really worthwhile things. But as he goes through this, I think one of the most significant things in the entire farewell address, he says of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars. What makes us politically successful? Religion and morality. And if you oppose religion and morality, and again, don't be confused, we're talking about Christianity and the Bible, which helps us learn to live a virtuous, godly life. 
So if you oppose the Bible and godliness, that's what religion and morality are. If you oppose the Bible and godliness, he says, then you shouldn't even consider yourself a patriot, right? Because you're against what makes America unique and special and free. This is the foundation of our nation. As you look back at what the founding father's birth, the founding father's idea was to give people freedom to worship and follow God according to their own conscience, according to where God led them, to not let a tyrannical, oppressive government come in. We set up a constitution so there was a separation of powers and there was checks and balances and we had different branches and, and, and we made sure jurisdictions were clearly delineated. And in the midst of this, they said that's still not enough. There needs to be more limits. Let's put a Bill of Rights. And in the Bill of Rights, we'll make sure we clarify what the federal government can never touch. If you go back and you read the declaration, almost every one of the 27 grievances, the government's infringing on right now. If you read the Bill of Rights, almost everything in the Bill of Rights, the government is opposing right now. The way that we restore our freedom has to be by restoring religion and morality first, because that's the only way freedom works, but it has to be Christians getting back involved in the process, right? The Bible is very clear. When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. And in the midst of all our conversations, there are so much more things we could say. There's a lot deeper we could go. I'd encourage you. If you want to know more, go to our website, wallbuilders.com. We have so much information there. We actually have a daily radio program. We, we're all on basically every social media outlet there is. We do videos every single week. And on our website, we have hundreds, if not thousands of articles, things that are free. You can download, you can read, you can study. And we have original documents. You can go back and read these actual letters and documents. And then we have lots of resources available as well. We have some resources at a table outside if you want some. But what I want to encourage and challenge us with is this nation has become the greatest nation in the history of the world because of the influence of Christians and Christianity. The only way this nation survives or will ever achieve or restore greatness is if Christians once again get involved and promote godliness and righteousness again. Thank you guys so much for letting me share with you. Thank you, Tim. Woo! Uh, I'm fired up. Are you fired up? He's got me going. I know as commander in chief of my house, we're going to get more involved. Well, I was remembering something Pastor George uh, said when he was teaching on the two party platforms before the election. And that's when uh, I believe he was accused of being political. And you could see the thumbprint of God throughout our constitution. And what Pastor George says was, I'm not being political. He said, I'm being biblical. And how thankful are we for pastors that care enough about us, Pastor George and Pastor Terry, to want this to go through uh, with wall builders. Uh, we're just very thankful. Ephesians chapter 1 says that the Lord ordered our steps before the foundations of the earth. So if you think about that, he knew where he was going to put you when you were born. So if we do everything as unto the Lord, then what kind of Americans should we be as Christian Americans? Amen? He put us here on purpose. He put us here with a purpose. So it's time, it's the call to action we heard from Tim. It's time that Christians get more involved in government. Amen? All right, well, praise God. Uh, well, Romans 12.10 says to outdo one another in showing honor. So we have an opportunity to show honor to wall builders. How thankful are we? Let's give them another hand. So tonight we have an opportunity to show honor by giving to wall builders and, uh, and praying for them. Amen. They're, they're out there. I saw his schedule. Tim shared his schedule. They are relentless, and they're doing this restlessly. So we want to help support them to get this message out. Amen? So if you're going to give tonight by text, text EMIC guest, dollar amount to 36609. By check, make your checks payable to EMIC. The envelopes are provided in the tables in front of you, and we'll collect those on the doors on the way out. And by phone, 877-281-6297. And by mail, EMIC, Fort Worth, Texas, 76192. I'm going to ask prayer minister team to come on up here. If you have any prayer request, 
We want to agree with you in prayer. We want to lock our faith in with yours. Our ministers are anointed and appointed to pray with you. So did you all get something out of this tonight? All right, well, praise God. We have an awesome service plan on Sunday. But until then, God loves you. We love you. And Jesus is Lord. Praise God. Well, praise God. What an amazing week we've had. What an amazing series this has been, this constitutional education series with Tim Barton, with Jonathan Ritchie from Wall Builders. I know that I've been blessed. I know I've been inspired. I've been challenged. I've been encouraged. And I believe that the same can be said of you. So I would encourage you, go back, watch these over and over and over again, especially if you miss a week. These guys talk fast. There's a lot of information to get there. So check it out on the emic.org archives on our website. So a couple of really cool things coming up starting this weekend, Friday night with the Flashpoint Live event in Atlanta. So take a look at this and then stay tuned because there's something else after that. Tulsa was only the beginning. Join Flashpoint Live in Atlanta, Georgia for the next stop of our Take America Back Tour. Friday, July 1st at the Gas South Arena. Kick off the July 4th weekend with Gene Lance, Hank, Mario, and Dutch as we unpack the stories currently impacting our country. Visit us online at govictory.com slash FPLive for more information and to register for this free event. And the power where we could walk and be blessed, blessed in the spirit, blessed in the soul, the mind, the will, the emotions, blessed in the flesh, blessed financially. It's wide open faith at the Southwest Believers Convention. Register today at kcm.org slash SWBC. forget flashpoint live in atlanta if you're anywhere close to atlanta or if you're not close to atlanta get to atlanta it's going to be an amazing time at flashpoint live especially in light of some of the things that we have seen god doing in our nation in our supreme court it's going to be a celebration of that and looking forward to what god is going to do he is not done with america in fact he is just getting started and then of course southwest believers convention august 1st through the 6th you just saw that promo spot with brother copeland i get fired up i love listening to Brother Copeland anytime, but especially at Southwest Believers Con Convention. There's something special on the prophet during that week where he gets to bring the word along with all our other speakers, all our other guests. It is an amazing week. Do whatever you've got to do to make sure that you join us this year at Southwest Believers Convention in Fort Worth, Texas, August 1st through the 6th. It's going to be amazing. All right, until next time, remember this, God loves you, we love you, and Jesus is Lord. Thank you.